Grapple Arts Radio. Hey everybody, Stefan Kesting from GrappleArts.com here. Today I'm going to be talking to Roy Dean. And Roy Dean, if you've been online, you've probably run into his material on YouTube or his website. He's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. He's got a really slick uh, style on the ground and a very personable, very friendly teaching style. But uh, first of all, Roy's just back from England, and I didn't even get to find out why he was going to England. So what the heck were you doing in England, Roy? Hey, it's great to be here, Stefan. I was in England visiting a couple of my affiliate schools out there and happy to say that they're progressing very nicely. I awarded another purple belt while I was out there. And it was, uh, yeah, the trip couldn't have been better. Great people. Weather was fantastic. And so happy to be back in the States, but I look forward to those trips um, overseas to visit my friends and affiliates. I've always wanted to go to England. Uh, did you get any time for sightseeing? Did you go uh, take the, uh, the necessary photos with the uh, Buckingham Palace guards and all that stuff? Or was it all you work, know, work, on work? My, on my first trip, I did do that. We did kind of an exhaustive tour of London and went to Stonehenge and, you know, did all those goodies. But uh, this trip uh, was much more relaxing. Um, I stayed with my friends, uh, Stephen Kirsty. They have a, a place right on the beach in Sandbanks. Uh, and since the weather was fantastic, there were a number of people on the beach all the time. It was, it was really good. And that's definitely the kind of, um, it was work, but it's, they also combined it into a vacation. So that was, it was really excellent. Cool. Okay. Well, let's get sort of started. For the people who've never met you or don't know anything about you, why don't you take us a little bit through your martial arts history? Uh, I know you didn't start in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You started with the much more traditional martial arts, as did I. So I'm always interested to see what a person's progression is to deciding that rolling around on the ground with men wearing pajamas is a good idea. It, it, it is. It's definitely a progression. So, um, you know, when I was 16, uh, I was sent to Japan as an exchange student, a rotary exchange student. And... While I was over there, um, they asked me to do a, a Japanese art after school, and I had a couple of different choices. I could do Kudo, which is archery, or Ikebana, flower arranging, but I chose Judo, and they warned me, oh, Judo training is very severe, but um, I was ready for it. I wanted, to, I wanted to work out my energy, so I started training with my high school uh, Judo team, which is similar to like an American wrestling team, high school wrestling team. And I trained six days a week, competed once a month, and really immersed myself in it. Um, by the time I came back to the States, I had won enough competitions to uh, receive my first degree black belt. And then I just kept on going. Now, judo in the U.S. is a little bit different than it. It's quite a bit different than it is in Japan. There, it's like a cultural institution. It's everywhere. Um, here, it was... The level wasn't the same. The training wasn't the same. So I started to look elsewhere um, and ended up in Aikido. Uh, did Aikido for a number of years and then decided to get serious about it and moved into the dojo of an Aikido and Japanese jiu-jitsu master named Julio Toribio. Um, uh, Sensei Toribio was in Monterey, California. So I moved from my hometown of Anchorage, Alaska to Monterey, California, Lived in the dojo for 18 months, trained every class every day, um, and, you know, studied Japanese jiu-jitsu, Iaido, and in just over time, continued to train. Um, and during that time, when I was actually living in the dojo, uh, I had a, a friend who introduced me to Claudio Franza, who was one of the first Brazilians in Northern California who's a legitimate black belt in BJJ. So I began training with him and um, eventually received my blue belt under him by the time I moved to Southern California, San Diego, to continue my university education. Um, I got hooked up with Roy Harris. Uh, he was recommended to me by Garth Taylor, one of Claudio's top students, as be having a very kind of intellectual approach, mm -hmm. being that he came from a JKD background, and he was one of the first Americans to get his black belt in BJJ. So He's a very, very serious student of the martial arts. 
Oh, indeed. Uh, it's it's difficult unless you meet him to really understand like how analytical his mind is and how deeply he studies things. Um, and so he was the right teacher for me, you know, uh, at that time I needed just a, a different, maybe a slightly more verbal approach, um, and specifics on how to improve, how to, I was a blue belt. I was a pretty good blue belt, but how to make it to that next level of purple and continue my journey. So he was the right teacher for me. And, um, purple through black belt he awarded me those ranks and i'm very proud to uh, be a student of his and to have him as my instructor and friend the uh, when the student is ready the teacher will appear or the teacher who's right for the student at that time will appear it it worked out in this case and hopefully it works out in other people's cases as well okay all right well people always talk about how wrestling is a great basis for things like mma and even if you end up being more of a striking oriented wrestler or excuse me more of a striking oriented mma guy that the basis of wrestling gives you that mental toughness now do you think that there's a similar carryover from judo into brazilian jiu-jitsu and judo to a lesser degree into submission grappling is there uh what's the the relationship between those two arts when it comes to actually performing on the mats that's an that's an excellent question i would say that there is definite carryover between judo and BJJ, if you start out in judo um, and can kind of empty your cup and then be very receptive to the approach of BJJ, um, you're going to come out ahead. I mean, <clears throat> just the emphasis on um, osikomi or immobilizations and being able to hold down your partner, um, the speed that is necessary in judo, and also the sheer number of repetitions that you have to do in order to ingrain mm -hmm. a throw in your neuromuscular memory. Those things, you know, sometimes on the ground, guys would be like, yeah, I did the arm bar like four times each side. Let's move on to the next thing. And judo teaches you early on. It's like four to 400 times, maybe. Per, you per know, training session. <laughs> per, per, per training session, 400 times. You know, you want to get to that point where it's like a reaction. It's, it's without thought. And I imagine I don't have that much experience in wrestling. I did, as a brown belt, attend a, uh, a wrestling camp um, with um, actually Mark Munoz and Uriah Faber were, were the coaches there. And it was, it was very, very instructive for me to understand the wrestling mentality. Um, and it's, it's different. I think that wrestlers that come into BJJ if they are open and a lot of wrestlers um you know they want to be as good as they can as quick as they can so they may not like the gi they only want to do submission wrestling and um they just want to maintain top position and they feel that's winning but you know if they're already ahead just by the benefit of them wrestling they understand takedowns better they understand repetitions they understand um being aggressive and how small those windows of opportunity can be you know, if you set someone up for a shot. So, you know, having that uh, background is a huge advantage, plus the ability to generate pressure from up top, which wrestlers are excellent at. That that puts them, you know, further ahead. Obviously, the rules of the sport dictate the um, the training approach and even the strategy for a match. So things are really compressed in judo. Things are even more compressed in wrestling. Uh, but they're both valuable arts and uh, I don't really see that much difference between BJJ, judo and wrestling. To me, they're all grappling arts and in a way they're all arts of uh, angles, distraction and leverage, which I feel is jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a universal language, but certainly the rules do tend to influence the way in which the art is expressed or in which the, angles and the leverage and the, the universal principles are expressed. I, my own main instructor for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Marcus Suarez, always said that if you want to know if your pin escapes work, go against the judo guy because their pin escapes are, are fierce. They're mm. a lot tighter for the same years of training than a lot of the Jiu-Jitsu guys because they're, all, they're not going for the submission as much. If, they pin, if I'm going against the judo guy and he pins me for 25 seconds, the match is over. Why would he even bother going for an arm bar or a triangle or a choke? He, he's just going to go for the pin. So they've got this 
dogged clamp on and hold. You know, even if there's an earthquake and the ceiling falls down, they're going to hold on to that pin. Exactly. And they can afford to put 100% energy into in that direction for the pin. And similar with wrestling, it's remarkably difficult, I found during the wrestling camp, to actually pin someone just on their shoulders. Not just put them on their back, but actually pin their shoulders, especially when they're savvy with a strong bridge. So, you know, they can afford to put 100% energy in that particular direction. That is, um, you know, and BJJ guys just won't do that. It's like, well, that's not the end. So mm -hmm. it's, it's different. It's but not they flowing can, with the go. Is, <laughs> as Hickson beautifully stated. Yeah. Well, we've talked about judo. We've talked about wrestling. You mentioned another martial art that's typically not thought of as very combative, in, and that's Aikido. Mm. I once heard Aikido described as an excellent art for restraining aged professors run amok. <laughs> but, but I've seen you use certain Aikido techniques and teach certain Aikido techniques, and I have also incorporated a few of them. So why don't we talk about how that art that's often trained cooperatively, translates into our art, into the grappling, to the Brazilian jiu-jitsu, that's trained mostly competitively. So could you talk a bit about how, what you learn from Aikido that you can then use on the mat in jiu-jitsu? Mm. There is, there's so many lessons in, um, in Aikido that I've been able to translate over to jiu-jitsu of all kinds. Um, and BJJ, the the thing with Aikido is it is generally considered a cooperative martial art, a nonviolent, purely defensive cooperative martial art. And as you have trained in a variety or been exposed to a variety of Aikido styles, even some Japanese jiu-jitsu styles that some people would label as Aikido because that's kind of what they're familiar with, um, you know, w w the, the further you go back to the roots of Aikido, the kind of more hard style it is, so to speak, where they might have pressure points, they might have strikes, you know, the circles are tighter. Um, but the, the lessons of Aikido, uh, it's all about being okay to blend. And you don't see that that much, for example, with wrestling or judo judo a, a little bit they kind of talk about it at the higher levels but in aikido it's stressed from day one it's all about being able to blend with the attack being able to time it and then if you know somebody gives you seven units of energy and you only have three to oppose it with they're going to win but then if somebody gives you seven units of energy and you blend with it and add your own two then you have nine units of energy going in your direction and then voila, you magnify your strength. But that takes a lot of skill. Uh, with Aikido, I think the emphasis on blending with the attack and being able to see, being able to recognize distances very, very clearly, it's more like striking in that respect than to grappling because people come in with strikes or, you know, how to be able to corkscrew your hips in order to generate... Uh, in order to generate power, drop your hips and corkscrew your hips. And if you're mm -hmm. doing BJJ, you're doing the same thing, but you're doing it in the opposite direction. When you are on your back and you shoot your hips up and corkscrew for an arm lock to make a really tight arm lock, that's the same motion. It's just in Aikido, if you're doing a wrist lock, you corkscrew your hips down. In BJJ, you corkscrew your hips mm -hmm. up. Uh, so it helps you understand a little bit more about you know, body mechanics, it gives you the green light to go ahead and blend with your partner. And in my own particular BJJ style, there's a lot of blending. Um, I can sort of enforce my will and generate a lot of pressure, but generally if somebody's stronger, I just recognize, oh man, that guy's stronger and I'll try to blend with it as much as possible. So Aikido, although it's not that popular, goes like all martial arts in and out of popularity um, it's powerful. And if you get together with a really good practitioner of Aikido, uh, it can be impressive. Um, and it's not to be underestimated. That's, that's the first rule of being a martial artist. Respect everyone. Don't underestimate anybody because, um, that can be a bad day for you. Well, I remember sparring many years ago with a guy who had done a lot of Aikijutsu and a lot of Aikido, and he was a big, powerful guy. He wasn't a, a frail wisp of a man. He was a big, powerful guy. 
but you always had to be careful whenever you were standing or on the ground because he would try to get some kind of forearm on forearm contact. He would try and step forward, get a point of reference, and from there, it was 100% of the time, go for the wrist lock. And I, it is my story, so in my version of the story, I don't think he ever got me in a wrist lock, but he came very, very close many times. Mm. And I'd always be, I'd be super worried about it all the time, whether we were standing or on the ground. So even there's, I think, some carryover from the technique. Certainly, I adopted a few of the wrist locks from Aikido or Aikijutsu, and I know you have as well. Yeah, the wrist lock is a great one to, to be able to carry over, you know, and you can apply that. You can apply it standing. It's even better on the ground because you've eliminated all their movement options. You know, if somebody almost gets a wrist lock on you standing, usually you get out of it by kind of moving to the third point or wherever they're trying to throw you. Um, but on the ground, you know, if you have somebody, you pass their guard, you have someone in side control, you have your shin over their bicep, and then you use your hand to press down on their wrist, their elbow is backstop against the ground. They can't move. Mm -hmm. they, they, are, they are done. So, you know, they, they can be really effective and very sneaky they come, because the range of motion is so small. They can come on very quickly. And um, so they are definitely effective attacks. Uh, you know, but if you need a lot of tricks in your bag, you know, if you are relying on your wrist lock only, and you don't have other techniques to be able to set it up, then you, if you miss it, you're, you know, it's not a good day. It's not a good day. Yeah. So I, I, I think that, you know, Aikido could definitely benefit from incorporating a little more resistance into their training method. Um, there are arguments that it can't be done, but uh, when I first encountered BJJ, I was like, there's no way guys can do this without getting injured. And every once in a while, there is a little tweak here or there, but... Um, you know, you you can do more than you think with resistance and and learn quite a bit. I think I think Aikido could definitely use um, a little bit of uh, Kano's innovation of Randori. Do you know if that was part of the original Aikido? Because in the limited amounts of reading I've done about the early history of Aikido, it seems like the founder and the people around him were, you know, pretty badass. Oh, Morihei Ueshiba Osensei, the founder of Aikido, was definitely a of he had razor sharp technique you know he was he was badass and but just because somebody was badass back then doesn't mean that you know the art they hand down is necessarily badass it's each practitioner every generation has to reinvent effectiveness for themselves so you know when i was studying aikido i was like okay this is good it's not quite working for me yet i don't have the ability that Oh, sensei had maybe I should be studying what he studied rather than studying the art that he handed down um, mm -hmm. you know it's a different way of thinking about it uh, one thing that he did one he studied Daitoru Aiki Jiu Jitsu he didn't study Aikido so that's part of it and in learning other Japanese Jiu Jitsu forms like Hakuryu Jiu Jitsu uh, or uh, Seibukan Jiu Jitsu um, I was able to study techniques that he had actually eliminated out of Aikido, techniques he had taken out. Um, so you look at Aikido a little bit differently, said, okay, he, he knew these techniques, but he, did, he chose not to teach them, or they weren't part of his personal expression. Also, um, he had a lot of attributes. He, they said his arms, when he, he worked in Hokkaido for some time to kind of found, um, found a town up there, and he was doing a, quite a bit of logging. And apparently his arms were massive. Massive. Like as big as people's legs. So he was a strong guy. He trained like a madman. And some people, there's a little bit of speculation. There, there may have been some bipolarity there. But he trained like a madman. He had all the physical attributes. And he had a razor-sharp technique taught by a guy who was a true killer, Sokaku Takeda, who had killed many men in his time. So you combine all that, yeah, you're going to end up with somebody who's effective. And particularly against judo players of the time, when you read stories about, you know, the judo guys challenging, like, Morihei Ueshiba, um, 
the judo guys like Kenji Tomoki, when he went and attacked him, you know, he was like, this old man, I'm not going to attack this old man. And he was like, no, go ahead and attack me. So when Kenji Tomoki attacked him, he found himself thrown to the other end of the room. And he was like, wait a minute. Okay, all right, let me do that again. He's like, okay, you can do it again. So he attacked him again with everything he had, and he mysteriously found himself thrown to the other side of the room. And then he bowed and said, I would humbly like to become your student. And so what was that? Well, a lot of it is, you know, technological superiority. Not saying the techniques of Aikido are superior to those of Judo. Um, I'm saying that he was using a technology basically the standing grappling as soon as somebody goes in to reach for you you blend with it in judo you just grab each other and then you begin but because he was working at a different range of motion really no different than hoist gracie in the first couple of ufc's because he was working in that altered range of combat that the judo guy wasn't familiar with he had clearly the upper hand so i think that goes a long way in explaining a lot of the stories of Aikido being able to best judo in a few challenge matches in the early days of um, of the art. Well, I like what you were saying about that every practitioner or every generation has to reinvent the art for itself. If you take arguably the most effective striking system, let's just say it's boxing. It, it could be mm -hmm. Muay Thai, it could be something else. Let's just say it's boxing. And I decide to get rid of sparring and boxing, and we're all just going to make it drills. And then I teach a, a whole generation of students, and then they go and teach it to a whole generation of students. Within a couple generations of students, we've taken it from, arguably, the most effective striking art to something that resembles, that's going to end up resembling, you know, one person solo forms of kung fu, where you're hopping around and pretending to bob and weave, and you, you'll have gotten rid of most of the combat uh, efficacy within a couple of generations. So it's, it's up, it would be up to each subsequent generation to check in and say, wait a second, are we still doing this in a way that, that will make it work? And typically that in our world, that would be using it against resistance. We are mm. really trying to armbar somebody who's really trying not to get armbarred and is really trying to armbar us in return or choke us out or, or whatever. I, exactly. That's a perfect way of expressing, um, unfortunately, what's happened in some arts. Mm -hmm. And and that's and you know, and that's why I love, I love competition. I love the ability to compete. You can compete. You cannot compete. Uh, but having the option of competition and that full resistance is what keeps the teeth sharp in an art. Obviously, every time you step on the mat and spar with someone, it's a form of competition. But let's talk about the big picture of like the, the sort of official version of competition where you're going to a tournament. How much of that have you done? Uh, I've done a fair amount. I've done a fair amount. Um, you know, I competed every month in, in Japan uh, doing judo competitions. Um, when I was... A blue belt, I competed quite a bit. The competition scene was much smaller back in those days. You know, it was mainly Northern California where I was training. So United Gracie tournaments and, you know, U.S. Open, Claudio Francis tournament. Um, and then when I moved to Southern California, blue belt, purple belt, I continued to compete. And competition for me was, you know, a part of the process. I, I want to see what I could do. I wanted to go out there and I wanted to improve, you know, and I knew the competition, the best guys were competing. The guys I admired were competing and I wanted to be like them. I wanted those skills. I wanted to be able to go out in competition and, and represent. And I lost every match until I won my first, um, until I won my first competition, which was grapplers quest. Um, and it was, it was great. It was great. I wouldn't train those competition experiences for anything. If my students want to compete, I, first of all, I'll pick a good competition for them to do because not all competitions are the same. Um, and I try to facilitate a good experience for that. Um, uh, I'm not competing anymore. I don't feel the fire that I used to. And, 
you know, honestly, if you're not really fired up about a competition, if you're not incredibly motivated to go out there and win, um, then at high levels, you shouldn't be out there. Um, it, because guys are hungry. They're very, very hungry to win. And if the fire isn't in the belly anymore, um, you know, there are other challenges in life where you can invest your energy. But the competition experience I experiences that I did partake in um, were fantastic. And I'm happy that I was able to, to win some competitions and just to be able to pass that on to my students if they choose to go in that direction. What was it for you that made the jump? It sounds like you lost, you lost, you lost, you lost, and then you won a whole bunch. So what was the quantum leap or what was the, the shift that happened for you? Or was it just just luck and, and time in the art? Mm, it, was, it was a combination of factors. Number one, I was tired of losing. And I said, this is it. I remember warming up for that Grappler's Quest and I was like, this is it. This is my time. It's going to happen now. And there are... Yeah, it, it it was it was great. It was uh I had also begun the shift to more drilling instead of just showing up to class and rolling. So, uh I had gotten a training partner at that time in Blue Belt, um one of my best friends, Brad Hirakawa. Uh we became training partners. We started drilling uh under Mr. Harris's guidance. He was like, "Okay, you got to get a training partner and you have to start drilling." So, doing basic drills, you know, arm lock triangle, arm lock, or foot lock drills, or just drilling. Uh, and then, Do you mean competitive drilling or technique repetition drilling? Technique repetition drilling, but doing every one with, you know, authority and, and just ingraining okay. those things into my body. That is when I really turned a corner. You turn a corner from white belt to blue belt, but then, like, mid-blue to go to get to that high blue stage where you're you know, that bridge between blue and purple is all about being able to do enough repetitions so that you understand and can flow effortlessly from one technique to another within particular systems of techniques, you know, like uma plata, triangle arm lock, or, you know, those related techniques, you can flow very smoothly with no gap in between them. So I'd undertaken that kind of training. So it was a little bit of mental focus, um, determination, it was a no-gi tournament. I tend to do better no-gi. My weight was on. It was just, you know, I feel a lot of times, no matter how hard you train, um, competition success is often a combination of factors. You choose the right weight category. You're paired up with the right people. You know, your draw on the tournament is favorable. Um, you're well-rested. You... There could be so many small factors. Your training camp was great. You have relatively low injuries. Or maybe you have an injury that makes you focus that much more. Um, you know, you had a hard weight cut. You suffered for it, and you're mentally that much more focused than you've ever been before because you know how much you've put into this particular experience. You know, competition is, is a beautiful thing. And for a lot of people, it's... Uh, you know, it's their rite of passage. But competitions are not always great for people in that um, the likelihood of injury is much higher. Um, sometimes they train, train, train. They pay a lot of money. They're out there for like three, four minutes. They lose. You know, maybe they had a great experience. Maybe it was a bad referee call. I mean, these things happen. So I feel like true competition success is kind of a combination of factors that all align and then voila it just happens one day you're at the podium and uh and you're smiling and then you celebrate that night if you had to guess what do you think per per minute of rolling or per hour of rolling in competition versus in class what do you think the injury rate differential is how much more likely are you to get injured in one hour of rolling in a competitive setting versus one hour of rolling in a in a more friendly class setting and I, and I ask, it's a little bit of a setup, because I remember reading what the statistics were in amateur wrestling. Uh, I have no idea what these statistics are in jiu-jitsu and, and MMA, where you have submissions allowed, and we can, well, in MMA, you can punch people. But uh, what do you think that the number is? Um, not to cheat the question, because I think I may have 
scene you post that it was oh, it, okay. it, it, you know i i would suspect it it depends on the competition it depends on the rules like for example you know just your local tournament white belt is probably like maybe two or three times higher that you're likely to get injured in a competition and honestly you may not even feel the injury in the competition you know um, because you're so adrenalized, you're so hepped up, mm -hmm. you know, but I will say that in preparation for a competition, your intensity goes up quite a bit because you feel, man, I'm going to be on the line. And I've seen the shift. I've had the shift in me. I've even had my students call me out when I told them I wasn't going to, I didn't let them know I was going to compete, but they're like, why are you being so mean? What, what's the matter with you? Why am I being so short with people? You know, things shift. You, the intensity of your training gets gets escalated and so your likelihood to get injured or to get uh it, while preparing for the competition is definitely higher your risk of injury in the competition i think is is higher um so those i think are both are both contributing factors but um but tell me about the the wrestling statistic oh well, if i can if i recall correctly then i think it's i think 40 times more likely per minute of competing versus per minute of training. Now, I mean, that's a very explosive art, but on the other hand, you know, we have joint locks, and certainly if, if you and I were competing and you had me in an arm lock, I would try and fight out of it for a lot longer than I would if we were just rolling around for fun, and you would probably hold it and apply it just a little bit harder than we would if we were just rolling around for fun. I mean, with And then you get to leg locks, if you're sparring at all with heel hooks and stuff, then I often just get to the position, don't even apply it when I'm sparring. But if I was competing, I would apply it if it was legal. Absolutely. You know, I remember seeing um, the Abu Dhabi competition in uh, New Jersey, and I was amazed because of, you know, heel hooks and toe holds. So many guys limped off the mat, and I just realized that was another... I was like, wow, I just can't believe how much these guys want it and how unwilling they are to tap to a submission. Um, it was it was really, you know, you have at that level, you have to ask yourself, are you willing to sustain, you know, an injury? And these guys, of course, they wouldn't they don't want to be injured, but um, sometimes too much heart uh, can lead to that. And and I've seen it many, many a time. Or the Jacare uh, Hodger Gracie match where Hodger caught the full on arm bar and it took Jacare, I, I'm trying to remember, about 15 seconds to work his way out of it. And then the arm was completely useless for the remaining 25 seconds of the match. And that's another example of heart to a, or a serious level of heart and uh, determination to win. That oh, yeah. if you don't have that, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Th that's that's true. And just as an aside, sometimes I've been injured many times in in my career, even just rolling. <clears throat> and I just I try to take those opportunities to continue rolling, unless it's something really really bad. I try to con take those opportunities to continue rolling, so I can uh, say, okay, I'm injured. I I tore my MCL. I I just broke my hand, but to continue rolling as an instructor at my level, I think that's, that can be beneficial training. That's not for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, that's a different thing. There, there are different levels of, of training that you can undergo. Um, I know some BJJ instructors that put their, their, their teachers through actual physical pain tests. It's not just heart, but it's like, it's straight up pain. And there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with that if people understand what they're getting into. But that's that's not for the recreational, you know, player. That's that's for building a different level of mental fortitude. Every once in a while you see a conversation online in one of the forums and the question is basically some variation of should you be allowed to get your Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt if you've never competed? Is some is having competed a necessary prerequisite of of whether you won or lost, of getting the black belt. What do you think about that? Is it an art or a sport? I feel it's an art that has a sport component, a Vale Tudo component, 
and a lifestyle component. So you do not, in my opinion, you don't have to compete in order to get um, a high level of technical mastery. Sure, the it puts you in under duress uh, in a in a very different way, you know. And if you want to have that experience, that's great. I think you'll be stronger for it. But do you have to in order to get your black belt? No. Um, do you, do you have to get in a fight to to know that BJJ is effective? No. Um, I've never been in a fight in my life. A couple close calls, but I've never been in a fight, and I have no intention of getting in one. Um, do I need to get in a fight? I don't think so. And a competition match is a limited rules fight. I mean, combative sports are limited rules fights. Um, and BJJ is, to me, an art. And it's something that's much bigger than the sport and the sport because it's um you know i'm happy that it's gained in popularity uh but you know jujitsu is a flexible and yielding art that can suit many different approaches and many different um modes of practice so if you are have been a lifer you know you've been training for 15 years under very very competent instruction i don't see any reason why you can't get your black belt Okay. So we agree then that you can't become a world champion without having competed, but you can become a black belt. I agree. Yeah. It, uh, I, I agree as well. And I think sometimes it's like knowing that you're going to die in the morning focuses the mind wonderfully. Knowing that you're going to compete in the month sometimes focuses your training wonderfully. And Eric Paulson, I think it was, said that sometimes you learn more in a single competition than you do in three, four, five, six months of training. And I think both of those things are true. Oh, I, I but agree. It is, a... But it isn't for everybody. No, it's, it's, it's not for everyone. It, it, you know, it's not for everyone. And, and not everybody wants to experience what you have to experience. You know, there's a roller coaster of emotions internally, externally. Um, emotions run high in competitions. Mm -hmm. And not everybody... It, it, I don't think it serves everybody as well as um, some people make it out to be. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's an option. It should always be an option. It should. That's what's going to continue to keep the art strong. But as you look at sport competition, um, you know, the more sophisticated the entries into some of these submissions and some of these positions, and as the positions get more exotic, uh, it gets more and more removed from street defense there's nothing wrong with mm -hmm. that that's the evolution of the sportive aspect of the art that's great that's beautiful let's keep that going let's keep it going let's 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 explore the range of human movement and um dynamic interactions uh and you know keep expanding the possibilities uh but you know it's the art is that powerful it can incorporate all practitioners and all different styles Oh no, somebody's jumped me in a parking lot. I'll pull upside down guard. Yes. <laughs> uh, exactly. That's well, my first thought. Yeah. Now, one thing that you've done a lot of, Roy, is you've produced a series of videos uh, the white belt Bible, blue belt requirements, purple belt requirements, brown belt requirements, and obviously you're working up to black belt requirements. So, you've obviously given a lot of thought to what the belts mean. Could you, in a sort of a condensed version, talk about how you see the progression from white to blue, blue to purple, purple to brown, brown to black, and what that means and what you need to see in somebody. Great question. Um, I was just discussing this with uh, my affiliate, Steve Granaway. Uh, you know, white to blue is, it's pretty cut and dried in my opinion. Um, white belt, don't know anything, you know, you learn the basic movements, you learn defense, you learn basic attacks. I feel that a blue belt, a fresh blue belt, should be able to, if attacked by someone that doesn't know anything, they would be able to defend themselves. And that could mean they get pushed down, you know, do a technical stand-up and run away. Um, 
if they get pushed down, they do the proper ukemi, protect their head, you know, round out their body. Uh, if they're attacked, they may be able to do an arm lock from the guard or maybe even do a, a, a guillotine choke. So against an untrained person, they would be able to submit them and be able to escape from that situation safely. I feel, you know, that is a great indication of what a blue belt is. And then I feel very comfortable giving somebody uh, a blue belt if they have that level of skill. Blue to purple, blue is a very thick belt. You know, to get to purple in BJJ, you have to be able to string techniques together. And I often use the analogy of you learn words at blue belt, uh, you learn like letters and how to write the letters and okay what alphabet are we working on here at white belt blue belt you're learning words purple you put those words into sentences and you start talking and then so somebody talking versus somebody that's just learning you know their abcs that it's not even fun it's i mean it can't be fun but um you know it's not that much of a challenge someone's speaking sentences against somebody who knows a couple of words it's still there's no you know, that's the, the difference in levels. You know, that's why the purple belt is so powerful. Um, because they taste the essence of jujitsu. They taste the power of jujitsu when they're able to, you know, have very small gaps in between one technique to the next. Now, purple belt to brown belt, it's more about adding conviction to your arguments. Yes, you can, um, you can do you know arm lock triangle arm lock or whatever technique but do you only play the guard you know if you need to can you play the top you need to have a well-rounded game and so if you're more of a guard player to get to brown belt i feel you need to work on your top game a lot be able to generate pressure be able to know when you're in a good position and have patience be able to hold your position when you're passing the guard you know, not to freak out. A lot of people at Blue Belt, they try passing the guard. They're not quite successful. The guy kind of, but they've made progress. And then people will go back all the way to zero. You know, they go mm -hmm. all the way back to trying to pass the guard completely. Whereas a brown belt, there might be a difficult guard. He'll just, you know, he'll pull half guard from the top. He will stuff a leg and, and go to, and just hold his position there and then work from that position. You know, he knows like a how, ratchet. how to hold his ground and, and he's got a lot of confidence. Conversely, if you have a strong top game, I want you to have a very playful bottom game and be able to submit people from the bottom. So purple to brown is a time of well-roundedness and also being able to generate, um, you know, conv have conviction in your arguments, be able to generate pressure from the top and the bottom. And then finally have multiple um conversational threads you got to be able to stack your attacks so one thing doesn't work you go on to the next thing you know and blue to purple you might have like two things that you're working on brown belt you have an array you have like five six techniques that you can do depends on how they resist you know so the, there are significant skill differences in between each belt level i feel uh and and I think the uh, the ranking in system in BJJ, you know, it accurately reflects those different levels of skill. Now, what do you think about the argument that, and, and I only occasionally take this argument, that you can get people motivated with things like belts, but then people mistake the belt for the end goal, and they get so fixated on the belt that it disrupts the relationship with the art, it disrupts their relationship with their teacher, it disrupts their relationship with their friends and their training partners, and they get all bitter about, well, I can beat Joe half the time and he's a blue belt and I'm not, and I'm gonna go and quit and go to another school because obviously my instructor hates me, and I've seen this so many times, and it's, it's really frustrating to me when I watch this because it's people uh, whose entire initial joy at training is being corrupted by this focus on on the belt. Hmm. I I agree. I see it all the time myself. Um, and I think as long as practitioners realize, all right, I'm after the skill that the belt represents rather than the belt. 
because there's a whole slew of problems that stem from people getting the belt and then, you know, and then you got to defend it. And, you know, they want the responsibility. They want the, um, some people think they want the responsibility and then they get it and they're like, wow, I wasn't really ready for this. Um, but under a competent instructor, he won't promote you. I mean, students are different. Some students, they, uh, they want the belt. They're ready for it. You give it to them and they're happy about it. Uh, others, they refuse the belt. You have to give it to them and then they're forced to step it up. And it, it has a lot to do with personality. Um, but you know, I think a really good instructor will be able to recognize the personality type, the learning style, what that person's ready for, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if people, you know, if they don't like that Joe got promoted and he's the same rank as me, but I beat him up. And if that's what you call a whatever belt, then it kind of discredits my own rank. People just need to drop that. You know, there's, there's too much personal identity involved with that. You got You got to let go and you have to just say, Hey, that's what the instructor deems. You know, sometimes the instructor looks at people differently. It's not a uniform standard of skill. Sometimes um, the instructor judges you based on if could you beat yourself up from a year ago, the day you walked in, you know, if you faced yourself, would you be able to submit you? It's kind of a strange question, but like that's how far is your individual progress in the art? Let's not compare it to all these other people. Sometimes that gets tricky. People are mm -hmm. are accelerating in their development. They're getting better. You're getting better. You get frustrated, you know, and, and the whole pecking order thing in BJJ is is great. But there's a, quite a bit of cognitive dissonance when people aren't settled with their position. You know, people at the top, people that get disgruntled about their rank and where they are and when they should be promoted, that's usually with people that are very, very close to them in skill. Whether they feel like, oh, that guy muscles it or whatever, they're usually fairly close in skill. They don't have problems with the people that are way better. You know, the blue belt, the disgruntled blue belt is not complaining about the brown belt that whoops up on him nor is he complaining about the the three-month white belt you know he's complaining about the guy who's basically neck and neck and that's where your frustrations are because you're kind of vying for where you are in the pecking order and some days you're on top and some days you're on bottom but you should just be com be content with your overall position in the pecking order so if you can just be okay with that look at the big picture kind of step back say well you know how would I fare against myself if I were to face the person I was three years ago when I walked into this school? I think that helps settle you. It helps ground you a little bit and helps prevent some of this, um, you know, short-sightedness about rank when it's really just being involved in the art is the joy itself. The people that you're able to meet with a common interest, uh, you know, don't shortchange that because of, you know, a little ego squabble. That approach also gives some perspective to people who are going, I'm just not getting any better. I'm just not getting any better. Joe could beat me up a month ago, and Joe can still beat me up now, or Joe could beat me up half a year ago, because Joe's been getting better at the same time as you. So often when new people start, they get really, really discouraged up until another new person starts. And then they realize how far they've come, because all of a sudden they can kick somebody's butt. Exactly. And exactly. the whole rising tide lifting all boats is a great thing but it's also confusing uh, if it's your first exposure to take a whole cohort of people getting better at the same time mm -hmm. now you've produced dvds you've produced iphone apps and you've produced some android apps can you just talk a little bit how people can get a hold of those or see what you have to offer absolutely um you know early on i entered the instructional dvd market and now I've entered the app market for iPhone, and I do have a few Android apps available. Um, you can just go to RoyDeanAcademy.com, explore my website, check it out. I have an app store there that links to iTunes. I also have instructional DVDs that you can order directly through me. 
or they're available on Amazon and other fine retailers. And soon uh, I'm going to be launching an online component where you can subscribe to the website and you can have access to any of the DVDs I've produced other media that isn't available on DVD. For example, I did a triangle choke seminar that's available only on iTunes as an app. And additionally, I'm going to start to film classes. Some will be public classes that I actually teach in my academy. Others will be a more one-on-one -on -one private lesson instructionals. But I'm looking forward to being able to offer that, particularly for my affiliate students. Uh, I want to get them and my affiliated clubs, they, I want to get them closer to what the experience is here at the Home Academy and, you know, be able to show them, although they've been here and they've trained with me, have them be able to take my lesson plans, you know, be able to, if they want to mimic uh, the lessons that I teach, that's totally fine. Um, I just want to be able to get them a little bit closer so they're able to disseminate the techniques that much more accurately. So I'm excited about this next chapter. It should launch in the fall of 2012. And um, yeah, I'm working with a few developers on this and it's off to a good start. So I'm really excited about being able to offer that um, both to my affiliates for which it'll be a free service. And then for anyone that is interested in training, uh, but can't actually make it over to Bend, Oregon. Uh, to join us at the main academy. We love having visitors. We get them from all over the place. And uh, a number of people have written me over the years saying, do you have an online program? I would love it if you had an online program similar to what the Gracies do. <clears throat> Personally, I'm not ready to, um, I'm not comfortable giving out rank online. That's not something that I'm uh, ready to do or comfortable doing. And each affiliate, I have to meet them face to face. We need to spend time together. I'm just, I'm very conservative in that, in that aspect. However, I like having a transparent mode in my academy. And that's what the whole uh, YouTube phenomena that uh, I involve myself with. I mean, I got involved with YouTube early on before YouTube was big and um, posting belt demonstrations. I just wanted people to see, hey, this is my process. And um, I won't be teaching BJJ forever, but while I do have an academy and while I do have students here, I want to share my process and hopefully that will inspire other people that they can do it too. They can have their own process. They can develop students to a high level of skill and be able to empower those people to go out and tackle other challenges in their lives. And if people want to come train with you hands on, then they should travel to Bend, Oregon, where your, where your school is. Exactly. And, um, and people always love, they're like, why are you in Bend, Oregon? And then they come out to Bend and they see what it's like out here. And it's, it's phenomenal. It's a beautiful town, clean air, beautiful river running through the town, parks. It's, it's, um, and it's an outdoorsman's paradise. So if you're interested in rock climbing, mountain biking, skiing, you name it. Um, it's a very fit town, very hip and, um, and it's home. So uh, anyone that wants to come by, have a getaway, and have a jujitsu adventure, uh, you're more than welcome to swing by. We love having visitors on the mat. So you found the perfect uh, midway point between Alaska and Southern California. I'm, I'm happy I, for I, you. <laughs> exactly. I do. I, that's exactly how I feel about it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for meeting with us today and uh, sharing your, your knowledge with the Grapple Arts readership and listenership, and I look forward to uh, to seeing what you're up to in the future. Take care, Roy. I appreciate it so much, Stefan. Take care.